Hi everybody, welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. I'm Gary Tucker. Last week we started a painting uh, based on an experience I had to Venice this past September. And in revisiting it, I thought it would be a good chance to talk about how I develop a painting um, in my studio. And oftentimes when I start, I start with a tonal study. A painting done in a single color, uh, usually smaller size, and uh, I gave you some of the reasons that I find this helpful. And it's prepared me, I feel, for uh, moving on to color. Um, this is the painting we'll be doing today. However, it was preceded by some other pieces. Of a, you can see there's a, a, a relation between the pieces. But these didn't quite come out according to my hope. Anyway, you see there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So today I want to talk about making a watercolor plan around uh, this painting of along the Zottere in Venice. I'll be talking about the watercolor plan, uh, rehearsing for that watercolor plan, and then thinking about my watercolor as a performance. So let's move over here to my desk and we'll get started. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that there's a PDF that you can download in the description of this video. And also, this may be a more pleasurable viewing experience if you watch it on an iPad or iPhone because of its vertical nature. So uh, prior to the painting, I did make some changes to the center of interest. I moved it a little higher, a little paler color behind the figures. And of course, I'm thinking in terms of color now, so I'm varying the color from blue in the background to more red in the foreground. So I, I made those changes or had those considerations after doing the black and white study. I'm trying to show you a little more about my <clears throat> studio space or my working methods today. I've got a little picture in picture of my palette, which will last for a little while, not through the duration of the painting, but you can at least see how uh, liquidy the colors are in the beginning and that's typically how I start with the pale wash uh, in conceiving the watercolor plan for this painting of course I'm considering how to use color most effectively and I decided to go with an underpainting and that's what I'm working on now an underpainting typically establishes some of the lighter hues or uh, some of the hues that you hope will uh, come through the more the transparent darks that we place later. So in essence, I'm painting with a very uh, watered down version of the colors. I'm using CAD yellow light and I'm using CAD red light and uh, to, to create this underpainting. I'm also being pretty conscious of um, the white of the paper, the parts that I'm leaving white. And this is so um, we can make greater use of those as we start to place the darks. So this underpainting accomplishes a couple of things. One's it's, one is it starts to create a real warmth in the painting that will uh, be an important part of the painting all the way through Number two, it starts to isolate these white areas and seeing them in front of you makes it a lot easier to work with darks and so on. And I've got my board at uh, a bit of an angle, probably about 45 degrees, and you'll notice as this uh, deep red wash starts to dry that the color uh, migrates towards the bottom of the painting and gives us a nice graded effect. And you also notice on the palette above how the color is slowly uh, moving downward. My palette is also on an angle. And um, part of this is so you as the audience can get an idea of the consistency of the paint. Um, I'm always trying to think of ways to show that aspect, that quality of the paint um, visually. And this may be one one way to do that is actually to have my palette at an angle and you get an idea of how runny or how weak the color is when you see it drifting to the bottom. So in terms of my watercolor plan, um, I'm almost finished with the first stage. Uh, 
And this first stage identifies, you know, some of the brighter areas of lights, tabletops, uh, public lighting. I have the awning as a white, but I know I'm going to be painting that later. So I've shifted my perspective here, and it's not the greatest view. In fact, you'll notice my shoulder intruding once in a while. <clears throat> I apologize for that. I only had one shot, and I'm, I'm going to show you this regardless of its quality. I don't, I, um, don't know any other way to do it. So that underpainting has dried. The underpainting has dried, and I'm coming back in with a very weak wash of a, a similar color of that um, cad red light. And while it's wet, I'm going to be building up the darker hues in the sky. It's a little hard to perceive the nature of this color, but it's largely a mixture of ultramarine blue, a little alizarin crimson, and even some neutral tint. Um, I'm looking for a really dark hue. I'm looking to... <clears throat> Again, exaggerate uh, the bright lights that are in the sky, the bright lights of the public lighting, the, um, uh, the figures eventually as we come to bear on the figures, and certainly the foreground is going to be quite dark as well. These are aspects that I am continuing uh, going forward with these particular qualities as a result of learning something from my tonal study. So these, uh, this is um, an extension of that tonal work. I varied the watercolor plan so that I can take advantage of some of the transparent qualities of watercolor. I've made a few modifications to the composition that I mentioned in the beginning. And uh, I practiced it a couple of times. I mean, I was trying to do uh, of course, a complete painting, but for one reason or another, it didn't quite work out, and so I took it as a as a learning step, as, and I feel I got closer to understanding my image. So close, in fact, that I'm working completely, um, you might say, blind. I have my tonal study to the left of the camera, <clears throat> but largely I'm painting based on what's happening in front of my eyes. And this is um, ideally the way that we work. Um, if we can work from a point of view of uh, sort of a internal understanding of our subject, in other words, we know where things go. We know basically the type of lighting we'd like to achieve. We know the colors uh, generally in our mind as we're painting we can adjust and we can manipulate uh, with much greater ease and confidence uh, as the watercolor is drying or as the watercolor is taking form on our piece of paper. So you see me doing that as it's um, as the paint is still wet I can manipulate it further. I'll add deeper hues as I see it's drying and maybe getting a little pale than I wanted it to I'll uh, manipulate edges. Um, I'll do all sorts of things while the paint is sort of plastic or manageable. And then I'll move on to the next section. This is another point that I gathered from doing these repetitions is um, how to manage this in sections. So I'm uh, very much conscious of um, where I can work and when I can work. In other words, you see me now bringing the, the darkness sort of down to a, a level area. I've isolated the public lighting, I've isolated the moon and some of the lights on the buildings, and it's going to come right down to an area where the tabletops begin. And while this area is wet, there's a lot of things I can and do do. I, I'll add color, I'll lift color, I'll soften edges, um, I'll push something out of the painting, or all sorts of things. And little accidents or unexpected things happen at this stage also. And I'm aware enough as I'm painting and not 
overly wedded to any image in front of me that I can allow those to remain and they become an important part of my painting as well. So the practice uh, paintings that you saw before as well as this tonal study that uh, we looked at last week, all of this has a, a strong influence on this painting and has prepared me to put that aside and concentrate more on what's happening within the painting. Now you can see actually some of that happening as I manipulate those colors um, in the sky even further. It's a wet area. I'm dropping in some very strong darks, but these darks have soft edges, so they're going to kind of melt into the sky, and this contrast of light against dark uh, is what is going to give depth and a feeling of the nocturne in the final image. You notice I have a couple brushes in my hand. This is so I can very quickly uh, change the size of the mark and the type of mark that I want. Uh, right now I'm using a sabolette. I use this a lot. In fact, if we see a close-up of it, you'll see it's rather well-worn. Uh, this sabolette is made by Lowell Cornell, and uh, you can find it through the Dick Blick catalog. It's a, uh, I like this brush because it's got a, a longer tip than most sabolettes. That means it'll hold a little more pigment. Also means that um, I have a little finer control with uh, some of the marks that I use towards the end of the painting. I have a few versions of this particular brush. The one I'm using now is well, most people would throw it away because it's so beat up, but I find it useful for dry, dry brush. Uh, use a rough paper. This is um, Arches 140 Rough, and the texture, if I'm doing some dry brush with this sort of texture, it will really wreak havoc on the brush bristles. Uh, they become frayed and sort of unusable for fine work. So I keep a couple versions of that brush. One version is for the sort of dry brush you saw me doing. Another version is for some finer detail that we'll see later. Well, I'm relatively happy with the background, so now you see me starting to prepare for the foreground. What I'm doing is just a light wash of dirty water to create some area that I can place some stronger pigment into and I'm going to test that and see how it moves before I um, create more of this this type of paint. That's an important stage I think is to create a little bit of a test before you commit to something. You can tell a lot just by standing and watching how the paint starts to move down. Um, we can uh, drop more color at this point, or we can add a little more water to the color at this point. And uh, we have time because we've, you know, wet the area, and uh, we can make that adjustment relatively quickly. So it's important when you start to make a big wash like that, like you see in front of you, to get a feeling of, is this the right thickness of paint? Uh, is it going to be a little too wet? Is it... Um, too thick. Watch how it drifts down the paper. So I'm pretty satisfied with it and as I build this wash below you see I've moved now to a bigger brush and I'm mixing the colors of alizarin crimson, a little bit of neutral tint, and a little bit of ultramarine blue. However this particular mixture favors the alizarin crimson and I'm trying to make a clear no, not clear. A subtle distinction. Uh, 
between the foreground and the background. I want there to be a, a similarity in the tonality, in other words, the lightness and the darkness, but I want there to be a, a color change that's um, not overly dramatic, but clearly visible. Now you can see how the pigment is drifting a little bit. Um, we'll probably need to add a bit more pigment at some point to get a feeling of the darkness that we want. But that uh, alizarin crimson is giving us a nice glow, and that glow is coming from the underpainting as well as the dark that we're placing on top. These, this combination, when we're working with transparent watercolor, is quite effective and creates a feeling of glow as though light is coming out from the painting. And that's what I'm searching for in this particular nocturne is to uh, sort of reenact that uh, evening along the Zatare in Venice where we were watching uh, the moon rise, we were watching uh, people moving back and forth, we were watching a lot of things happen in front of us and the, the dramatic lighting was particularly enjoyable. Well, I'm moving on from the foreground up into my main area. And you see here I'm working with a smaller brush, starting to create the details of the tabletops. Um, some figures are going to enter the picture now. Oh, that's a pretty strong application there. Is that going to work out? I think it will because, again, I had a, a smaller painting that I did in preparation for this larger piece. And I started with sort of a, a redder application in the figures. Later on, add some darks and some lights. But that um, red had a surprising um, value in the final painting. It created sort of a, an ambiance, a, a sort of um, uh, reference to the warm hues that are coming out of the cafe to see a figure bathed in red light or orangey light or yellow light um, reinforces this idea of a of a nocturne of the cafe being illuminated uh, in the nighttime and all of these qualities kind of come back to me as I'm painting these these memories I have of the evening and I can choose to exaggerate them or diminish them as I like. I also know that I'm going to use a bit of red in the awning above, so we'll try to relate this color uh, more to the finished piece as we move along. The figures are were drawn in, however I, I'm I see some of the pencil marks, others pencil marks have been covered and are hard to see. So sometimes it's a matter of uh, improvising these figures as well. I know basically where I want them to be. I know basically how big they should be related to the table. Um, but sometimes there's a little guesswork involved. And uh, I'm trying. These, this is the focal point of the painting. So... I want them to stand out, to look natural, to give a feeling of scale to the painting. So I'm using this smaller version of that same brush that I mentioned earlier, the low Cornell, which comes to a fine tip and allows me to uh, place a lot of detail. Well, we continue to add figures, um, putting uh, figures sitting at the table, having a good time, enjoying a meal on the Zatre. In this series, this little series, I'm trying to not only show you um, watercolor technique and how I use the brush or how I use pigment, but also give you an insight as to some of the things that go on prior to the painting. Um, that tonal study being one of the things and in, today in particular I've been talking about the watercolor plan and what I mean by that is um, 
sort of the, well, taking time before you do your painting to envision the steps, to envision the sequence, and um, in your mind anyway, to, to have an approach, a sort of a, a series of steps that you can execute that you envision will bring about the image as you want it. And uh, in doing this, you certainly isolate parts of the painting that may be difficult. You give yourself a strategy for color, whether you're going to be layering color or mixing it on the paper. You give yourself an idea of how to manage edges. And that's a, a big part of this painting and a big part of all the work I do is how do I manage the edges. And in this particular moment, what I'm doing is adjusting the moon, and that means blurring some of the edges, adding a bit of color to the moon. In essence, uh, yes, we're pushing it back into the painting so that our center of interest can come out with a greater impact. We're also <clears throat> bringing some of the similar hues that are active into the painting into that light area, whether it be a yellow or a red. And at this stage, it's much easier to make those adjustments, which is why you see me leave an abundance of whites through a, a lot of my work, is I realize that we can adjust this uh, once the painting has started to uh, reveal itself. We can manipulate those whites to stay strong and attractive, or we, in this case, we're kind of pushing them back into the painting with a little bit of color. Whether it's the public lighting to the right, the moon above, or the distant lights on the buildings, all of that um, is an important part of the painting, but we want it to harmonize with our center of interest and not compete with it. So the watercolor plan has, has given me um, confidence in doing this painting. And my plan was, uh, I'll reiterate, was to begin with an underpainting of light warm hues uh, and let that stage dry completely. Then return in parts of the painting. So I did start above and work down to the horizon line with mixtures of the colors I'm repeating throughout the painting. Mixtures of ultramarine blue, uh, a little bit of alizarin crimson, a little bit of cad yellow, cad red light, but a dominance of the ultramarine blue in the background, a dominance of the alizarin crimson in the foreground. And all of this had I had arrived at through doing some of the studies, and I had it kind of firmly in my mind uh, what I, the sort of steps I would take in realizing this painting. However, I do leave stuff up to chance, and an example of that would be uh, these uh, breaking lights that you see in the foreground, the kind of shafts of light that come forward. Um, we can hope for those. We can um, paint with those in mind, uh, but watercolor always has its own mind, and sometimes they come out, sometimes they don't. You'll notice there's a couple bright marks that um, in the lower right hand corner and I chose to leave those. I know that I can diminish them if I want but they had an interesting um, sensation to me, something that you might see in a photograph that's looking directly at the sun where the light is causing some sort of spots in the painting. And so I left them. This is an accidental area. There's others in the painting that I, I felt, I don't have to cover that up just yet. I'll leave it and see how it looks. So I'm more at ease in doing that, more comfortable doing that if I have the stages in plan and have a general idea of what to do and when. Well, the painting is looking good. It's starting to come out. Of course, I'm going to be adding these darks to the figures, darks of a neutral tint and some white accents to the shoulders. 
and so on. Things have dried, the color looks good, that transparent hue is coming through the foreground section. So I'm relatively happy, not only with this painting, but happy with the process. I learned a few things in uh, creating those small uh, studies, particularly the tonal study, and um, I was able to apply those in this painting. I should say that sometimes those tonal studies have um, their own strength, and I'm, I'm happy enough with a tonal study to even stop the project and just let that be the finished result. But I wanted to use this as a, as a way to show you um, a reliable way to develop your motif. So I hope you would take this, these, these things that I've pointed out today, working with the watercolor plan, compartmentalizing your watercolor so that you can manage edges, and allowing for some of the gaps or missed areas in your painting to remain with the idea you can adjust them later and allow for spontaneity in this way. So have a look at the description and you'll find a PDF that accompanies this uh, video. Um, also there's a playlist uh, of videos that are similar in nature to this one. So I hope you'll join me next week in Advancing with Watercolor. We're going to pay a visit to the Santa Maria della Salute, which is a famous cathedral on the main canal in Venice, made famous by just a lot of great painters in history. We'll look at how we can do something unique with this icon.